from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Okay, it's, it's me again. Uh, I'm still Patrick Anderson, and I still review books for The Post, and we're still glad that all of you are here, and thank you for being here. Uh, and I have, as before, been asked to announce that there may be some film done today for the Library of Congress, and if you don't want to be on film, hide your face. Um, our next speaker, Margaret Cole, C-O-E-L, Cole, is a fourth generation Coloradan who lives and writes in her home near Boulder. Uh, she's published 15 prize winning novels that are in the, very much in the tradition of her friend Tony Hillerman, who, who called her a master in the field. Uh, and the novels are set among the Arapaho Indians on Wyoming's Wind River Reservation. Uh, Margaret's most recent novel in the series is The Silent Spirit which was published the first of this month. Uh, at the end of her presentation, she will, she will take some questions. It's a pleasure to introduce Margaret Cole. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, and thank all of you for, as the Arapahoes would say, for coming under my tent. <laughs> It's just an, a pleasure to be here at the National Book Festival and, and a very great honor. And it's lovely to be able to have a chance to speak with all of you this morning. I do write about the Arapahoes, and so the question that I am asked as I go around the country is, and you can imagine what it is, uh, somebody just asked me that uh, outside here a minute ago, are you Arapaho? I am not. I am not Arapaho. So I say that, no, I'm not. And then people say, well, maybe you are, and maybe you just don't know. And I say, well, no. And then they say, well, have you had your DNA done? I say, well, which you can do on the internet now. I, well, no, actually, I haven't. I finally started saying, you know, the only people who have never asked me if I'm Arapaho are the Arapahoes. <laughs> but I do write about them. I became very, very interested in these people. And we writers write about what interests us. And I think that probably all books start with questions. We ask the questions, and our books are a way of finding the answers. So I was a writer. I've been a writer my entire life. I've never done anything else. I know you will meet writers today and hear writers talk today who have done all kinds of things before they became writers. I mean, they've been lawyers and engineers and, I don't know, astronauts or whatever. That is not me. I have always just been a writer. It is the only thing I ever wanted to do was write. And it's the only thing I've ever done. So I uh, started out as a newspaper reporter and then moved on to writing for magazines. I am a fourth generation Coloradan. So I grew up uh, on all the family stories of my area. And among those stories were stories about the people who lived there before the rest of us came. And those people on the plains of Colorado were the Arapahoes and the Cheyennes, the Plains Indians. In the mountains were the Utes, a whole different culture, different uh, type of, of uh, tribe, different background, not Plains Indians. But of all of them, I became interested in the Arapahoes. And why is that? I don't know. I don't know. It's one, of those, it's one of those mysteries, I guess. But there were a couple of things I know that, that did draw me to them. And one was, in the early days on the plains, uh, they were the traders. They were located on the plains of Colorado, which is centrally located. So they were able to trade with tribes all around them. And the first people who came from the east out there, the traders, the trappers, people like that who came out to the west, to Colorado, uh, they called them the businessmen of the plains. So I thought that was interesting. At the same time, they are very, very spiritual people, and I found that interesting too. So anyway, I became interested in these people. And I started asking the questions, well, who, who were they? And where did they live? And, and, and what happened to them, and where are they now? 
And those questions led to my first book, which was a nonfiction book on the Arapahoes. It was a history of the people, and it was a biography of one of their great leaders in the mid-1800s. So I started writing this book. I was writing for magazines at the time. I started out to write a magazine article on these people. I started doing all this research, and pretty soon I was in all these archives, including the National Archives. And it just went on and on and on. And I started finding all of this stuff that had never been published before. And I realized after five years of researching and writing about these people, working on this project, I realized at the end of five years that I had a 350-page magazine article. <laughs> so I realized I had a book. I had not set out to write one, but I had a book. And that became my first book. And it was published in 1981 by the University of Oklahoma Press. It has never gone out of print. And it's a biography and a history of the Arapaho people called Chief Left Hand. But that book took me into the Arapaho world. And again, I was trying to answer the questions that were raised in my own mind about these people. The government, in its infinite wisdom, even though they're Colorado people, sent them to a reservation in the middle of Wyoming. To, and, and that's where they are now. And they share the Wind River Reservation with the Shoshone Indians. So I uh, went on, I wrote uh, three other nonfiction books, uh, histories, and then I was attending a conference where Tony Hillerman was the speaker. And I'd actually been thinking about trying to write a novel, but I hadn't done anything about it. And Tony Hillerman spoke about writing about the Navajos and how that had enriched his life, going into their history and their culture. And I remember sitting in, this, in the middle of this huge ballroom, and all the time he's talking, I'm thinking, I could do that. I didn't have a clue whether I could do that, but I'm thinking, I could do that. I could do that with the Arapahoes. By that time, I'd spent a lot of time on the Wind River Reservation. I'd gotten to know the people. I had gotten to know many of the elders. I'd heard many of the stories. And I'd done all the research on their history, so I felt comfortable with giving it a try. So why a mystery novel? I had always, I've always followed the advice that I got from a writing teacher many years ago, which was, write what you love to read. And I love to read history, and I wrote history books. And I love to read biographies, and I wrote a biography. And I love to read mysteries. So I thought, well, if I'm going to write a novel, it's got to be a mystery novel. And I'm going to set it with the Arapahoes. And I'm going to do what Tony Hillerman did. So that, that, was, that was the beginning. The, 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 the little uh, germ of the idea that sent me on my way. When you decide to write a mystery novel, the first thing you have to think about is who will be your sleuths? Who's going to solve these mysteries? And the one thing I knew was that my sleuth, one of them at least, had to be an outsider, an outsider to the Arapaho culture, because that's what I am. So I wanted someone who was like me who would come into the culture, not know anything about these people, which I didn't know when I started working on them, uh, and begin to learn about them. And as that person learned about them and came to appreciate them, their very, very ancient history and, 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 and there's some, the richness of their culture, then my thought was, then my readers can come along on my character's journey. So then I started thinking, well, who are going to be these, uh, who would be an outsider on the reservation? Well, it could be an FBI agent, it could be a teacher, doctor, nurse, uh, a social worker. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people it could be. But I wasn't really getting excited about any of them, although they're all worthy. And then it hit me, there is a mission on the Wind River Reservation. It's called St. Stephen's Mission. And it has been there from almost the time in 1874 when the Arapahoes were placed there. And when they were placed there, some of the leaders actually went to Omaha and asked the Jesuit priests to come and educate their children. And they agreed to do that. They came, and the Arapahoes gave them the land upon which to build the mission and actually helped them build the mission. So I thought, this is great. I had not set out to write about a priest. It had never entered my mind that I would be writing about a priest. But I thought, this is great. He would be an outsider to this culture, and yet he would be part of something that has been part of this reservation almost from the beginning. So his name is Father John Aloysius O'Malley. 
I gave him the most Irish name I could think of. I then discovered that there are a number of Jesuit priests by the name of Father John O'Malley. I didn't know that till after the, the first book came out. None of them has been sent to the mission though. So anyway, that's how he came about. I decided not only would he be an outsider to the Arapaho culture, he would be an outsider to the West. He comes from Boston. They have trees in Boston. They don't have trees on the reservation, not very many. So it's a whole new thing. Everything is new. He's an outsider in every way. When I first started writing about him, he was perfect. He was father perfect. And I wrote, I wrote into the book, oh, just a short way, and with this perfect guy. And then I thought, OK, this isn't working because he is so boring. So I had to step back and rethink him. And when I did that, I realized that, oh, he's not perfect. No, no, this guy is not perfect. He's a recovering alcoholic. He's been banished out to the middle of, you know, what people in the East think is nowhere, in the middle of Wyoming, in this reservation, which, incidentally, the reservation itself, and which sits right, it's a little rectangle in the middle of Wyoming, is as large as the states of Rhode Island, Delaware and parts of Connecticut, and it's in the middle of Wyoming. So he's been banished out there, and he's, he's a fallen man who's trying to pick himself up. So he's a sinner, like the rest of us. And you know what? Sinners are a lot more interesting to write about than saints. So that's Father John. Now I have this white man on the reservation who is solving all the problems, and I didn't like that, and I very much wanted to write from the point of view of a woman, and I wanted to write from the point of view of an Arapaho, the strong Arapaho voice. So my character, Vicki Holden, was born. She's an Arapaho woman born and raised on the reservation, had a traditional life, which I wanted her to have, but I also needed her to have power, and those two things don't go together. So I had to give her a backstory, where she was married, she was married to an abusive, alcoholic man. She had to leave this jerk, which she did. And she went into Denver, and she became a lawyer. And now she's gone back to the reservation to help her people. And lawyers have power. Lawyers know how to make the law work for their clients. And that's what she is trying to do for her people. Now, of course, Father John, is he's my hero. So he is tall and handsome and red-haired and blue-eyed. And, uh, and he's virile, and he's, he's athletic. He's all these things. And of course, Vicki is beautiful. She has black hair and dark eyes and, and a dark complexion, and she's gorgeous. And then I started thinking, you know, Father John is this fallen man. <laughs> and he, you know, he's had his struggles, you know? And I thought, well, what if? What if? What would happen? I was writing one book. I had no idea, I had no idea I would be writing, you know, I, I just finished the 16th novel of, of, in this series. So I thought I'm writing one book. So I put, a, I put a little thing between them, just a little attraction, just, just to help the first book, which was The Ego Catcher, not knowing that now, and just finishing the 16th book, I'm still dealing with this little attraction <laughs> these poor people have, you know. <laughs> Father John, being a recovered, recovering alcoholic, is always, always coming close to maybe taking a drink. He's driven to that. Because in a mystery novel, big things are going on, tough things. And that's one reason I like to uh, read mysteries and one reason I like to write about them. Because they're life and death issues. And the characters really have to step up. They have to be smart. They have to be clever. They have to really figure out what's going on. And, and lives are at stake. So big issues. There are also a lot of social issues that mystery novelists can deal with. And my hope always is that when you read one of my novels, it will take you into the Arapaho world. It will take you onto the reservation and how these people live today and what's going on and, and those kinds of things. So because that's what mystery novels do. But anyway, Father John, being this recovering alcoholic, is always, in all the things he's dealing with in, no, in the novels, he comes close often to taking that drink. 
But of course, he never does. He backs off. He doesn't take it. So I was talking about this one time. And it was a, I was giving an after-dinner speech at a, to a large group in a ballroom. And I'm talking about how Father John comes very close, very close to taking a drink, but he doesn't do it. And from the back of the ballroom, this voice said, a slurred voice said, ah, let the poor guy have a drink. <laughs> so those are my characters and their struggles. And that is ongoing, of course, in all of the novels, no matter what they're working on. What they are working on, because I love history, and I wrote history before I started writing mystery novels. And I love the history of the Plains Indians. I love the history of the Arapahoes. And so I want to bring that into my books, and I do. So every one of the novels will deal with something in their history. So that, um, what they're working on always involves a crime that takes place in the present, of course, but it's a crime that will be related to something that happened in the past. Because I'm fascinated with, with that whole idea of, how, of, of what Faulkner said was, the past is not dead. It's not even the past. And that is certainly true in Indian country. The things that happened that we've forgotten about because we live in such a forward-moving forward society and the past for us is, if it happened yesterday, that's, that's a long time ago. For them, the things that happened in 1864 happened yesterday. They're still living with so much of, of the consequences of what happened in the past. So for me, that's just fascinating. And it makes uh, for, for fun topics to write about in my mystery novels. So The Silent Spirit, which just came out uh, September 1, and that is actually, it's the 14th in the series, but I do have a standalone novel that came out last year, which makes for my 15th, 15th novel. But in any case, The Silent Spirit is a novel that I've been wanting to write for quite some time. Because, again, it deals with the past, but it deals with kind of a fun thing that happened in the past. And that is, in, in the 1920s, early 1920s, the Arapahoes went to Hollywood to be in the movies. They were in the silent, some of the silent films. They were what they called at the time, they were the real Indians in the cowboy and Indian movies. And what had happened was uh, the studios were just beginning to film westerns. And what they did was hire extras and give them black wigs and paint them brown. And the problem was they kept falling off the horses. So they said, we got to get the real thing. And Jesse Lasky, the head of Lasky Studios, sent a man to Wyoming thinking, we'll find some Indians in Wyoming. And that man walked into the adjutant general's office there at the time, who was Tim McCoy. And some of you may remember Tim McCoy. Or you wouldn't remember him, and I don't think anybody here is that old, but you may have heard of him. Tim McCoy was, became a very, very big a uh, cowboy star in the early Western films. He, he made over 100 films, and he, w he became a really big star. Um, I, I watched some of his movies that he was in, and I've seen some of the posters for those movies, and he always wore a white Stetson, pulled low. He was very stern, very stern, and uh, you know, very serious, serious guy. And on the posters of his movies, they'll be splashed across the top in big letters, Tim McCoy. And then down in the corner, in real small letters, will be also with John Wayne. <laughs> so Tim McCoy went on to be a big, big guy. But how he got started was when this Lasky studio executive walked in and said, you know, we need some Indians. And Tim McCoy said, OK, I can get them for you. Tim McCoy was a real cowboy. And he had worked as a cowboy around the Wind River Reservation on the ranches there. And he had gotten to know the Arapaho people. And he had actually uh, learned their sign language so he could communicate with them in signs because some of the elderly people at that time uh, didn't speak English. They just spoke Arapaho. So he learned the sign language, which was the Plains Indian uh, universal language. So Tim McCoy said, I can get you some. 
But he worked to deal with the studios. First of all, they have to be paid the same as everybody else. They have to be treated equally. Uh, the studios wanted them to bring their teepees and their horses. And he said, fine, you pay them extra for that. This was unheard of in the 1920s. So then he went to the reservation, and he talked the Arapahoes and the Shoshones into going to Hollywood to be in the movies. So they went out to Hollywood, and actually they went to the desert of Nevada, and they filmed the first Western epic, which was called The Covered Wagon. And it's still a great DVD. But anyway, afterward, um, the studio asked 50 of them to go to Hollywood and to promote the movie by putting on an Indian show every evening before the movie was shown at the Groman's Egyptian Theater. So 50 of them went there with their teepees and their horses. They camped on Coanga Pass, which just is a hill right outside of Hollywood. And uh, those of you who know LA uh, are, would know it. At, and their teepees were up there. And then every day they would ride their horses down into Hollywood to go to work along the Hollywood, what is today the Hollywood Freeway. So I thought, this is great. This is great. This would be fun to write about. And they're very proud of this. They're very proud that they were in the movies. But I write mysteries, and I need to figure out, OK, how am I going to work this out? Then I started doing research on early Hollywood. And oh my, oh my, I found out 1920s Hollywood, oh, current day Hollywood has nothing on 1920s Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, it was a wide open, wildest place. Everybody's on cocaine, they're drinking orange blossoms, which was gin and vermouth and orange juice. And so it was a crazy place. But the studios tried to keep that all hidden because it wasn't good for the box office. And as I said, I was giving a talk not long ago, and I said, you know, because people out in, in uh, Iowa and Nebraska, they weren't doing those things. And somebody in the audience said, oh, yes, they were. <laughs> but anyway. Once I found that out, I also found out the studios controlled everything. They controlled the police, they controlled the DA. And there are cold case murder cases out there today that happened in the 1920s. Once I found that out, I thought, this is a mystery that has to be written, and the Arapahoes were there. So in the silent spirit, there is, of course, a murder in the present, but it's connected to a murder that happened in Hollywood in the 1920s to one of the Arapahoes who went out there to be in the movies. And so Father John and Vicki, of course, have to figure out uh, how, 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 is the, how are these two, two murders 90 years apart? How are they connected? And why is it that someone still wants to keep secret what had happened in the 1920s in Hollywood? So that is, that's the idea, and that's the, uh, the plot for The Silent Spirit. Probably all the novels that I write come from just a little germ of an idea like that, and from a question. And my question with The Silent Spirit was, what was that like? What was that like for these Arapaho people, some of whom had never been off the reservation, who had to get permission to leave the reservation? They couldn't just, they couldn't even go into a nearby town. And if they did go into a nearby town, there would be signs up saying, no Indians allowed. What was that like to go out there, to be in this incredible epic where they, they ended up having 300 of them from the reservation went, and then to go into Hollywood and to be there for months promoting this movie? So it was really out of that question, and as I say, the questions I wanted answered that, that the book came. So um, I think probably we have some time for questions. Any questions? Yes. Oh, you know what? I guess they need you to go to the mic. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, what is the feedback from the Arapaho people? The feedback from the Arapahoes. Thank you for asking that. Um, I just was on the reservation last week. The Arapaho people, when they were on the plains, they were known for their generosity and their hospitality. They are still known for their generosity and their hospitality. They have been very welcoming to me and very, very helpful. And um, about three years ago, they had a one book, one county, you know, their program. They chose one of my novels, Killing Raven. So everybody was supposedly reading the novel. And then I went up to Wyoming, and I uh, spoke to the college. I've also been invited many times to speak to their schools. Believe me, if they didn't like my books, they wouldn't let me near their children. Um, so, and I spoke to the schools, and then they gave a wonderful celebration for me. 
And they invite, when they give a celebration, uh, they give a party, you know, they don't invite you, you, and you, and not invite you, you, and you. As my, as they, my friends, the Arapaho friends say to me, you know, that's your way, Margaret. That's not our way. That's not the Indian way. That's what they'll say. So they invite everybody. So they gave this celebration. They put ads in the newspaper. They sent out flyers. And they're going to have food. I mean, this was making me nervous. But they know how, about how many people are going to come to these events. They had 300 people come. They had the elders there. They prayed for me in Arapaho. They had the uh, drummers and the singers there. They had an MC, uh, And they, they absolutely ladened me with gifts. They gave me a beautiful Pendleton blanket. And when they give you a blanket, they don't just hand you a folded blanket. They wrap you in the blanket. They gave me a number of other gifts. They gave me a card, a beautiful card. And on the front is painted the Eagle Catcher. And my first book was called The Eagle Catcher. And then inside, all the elders and the tribal councilmen, and they called them the business councilmen, um, and many other people who attended the event had signed the card. So it is truly the most precious thing I have. So um, you know, overall, I you know I think they've been really, really favorable. Yes, and, and you had a question. Oh, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Just real quick, what yeah. do you? What's your process for writing? Do you write okay. in the morning? Do you write at your home? Do you have right. to leave your house? Do you? My process for writing is I have a dedicated room in my house, my office. It, it's a bedroom turned into my office. And um, this is a job. Uh, I have a contract that I have to turn in a book every year. And so I have to, I have to produce the book. And actually, that's good for me. I know writers who say, oh, I don't know how you could work under a deadline. Well, I'm a kind of writer. If I don't have a deadline, I'm not working, you know? Uh, I'm an old journalist. <laughs> we, we wrote under deadlines. So it's good for me. I'm at my um, computer every morning by 8.30. I, I write for four or five hours. And then this is a business, so after the writing, there's a lot of business things I have to deal with, with my editor, my publicist, my uh, agent, and, you know, different things. And then, of course, for all of my books, there is a lot of research that I have to do. For example, you know, the Hollywood book, you know, I had to do, which was very fun, but I had to do a lot of research. I also got to go to Hollywood, of course, and tromp through all the places. But anyway, that, that's my schedule. And, I, and then I, I write a book a year. I also write maybe a couple of short stories every year and maybe an essay or, or whatever. I'm going to get her because she's been waiting that come back to you. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Since you used to write nonfiction and you probably still do some of that, do you, uh, with your research, do you have footnotes or what's true and what's not true in your books at the, at the I end? I do with my Thank research. You. And since I'm a, his, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, a not recovered historian, I cannot write something that is not true, in, even though it's fiction. But I've had to take some leeway. And, and if I ever have to do that, I put an author's note in. And I make it very clear to you what, you know, what, uh, what really happened as opposed to what I had happened. Quick example, in Eye of the Wolf, I have um, an old battleground in one county. It's actually right across the county line in another county. But I had to put it in the county it was in because otherwise I would have a different sheriff dealing with the crime that occurred there. You know, it would be just too complicated. So I put an author's note in at the end saying, don't email me and tell me that this Bates battlefield <laughs> is in this other county. I know it is. I had to put it into this county just because. Okay, yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you for waiting. Um, I wanted to ask you, because you've written now 15 uh, books, do you have a favorite or favorites? Because they're kind of like children, I'm sure, for you. So yeah. sort of comment on that and why. You know, I think the, my favorite book is always the one that's in my head. Mm. It's always the book I'm writing because mm. I, I'm living it. I'm with that book. And uh, at the time I'm writing a book, I'm always out promoting another book. So, um, and then people will ask me about the book that just came out, the one I'm promoting. And sometimes, I, you know, I really have to stop and think, what? What are you talking about? What character is that? Because that character isn't in the book I'm writing. And then, too, I think sometimes my favorite books um, 
have to do with whatever's going on in my personal life. And if I, you know, if there's some stress or family, you know, situation or whatever, that will kind of color the book. Yeah. And so, um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. But I, I, I really enjoyed The Silent Spirit. I loved writing it. I loved researching it. I loved the whole idea of it. Uh, it was just a fun book to work on. So I have to say right now that's, you know, probably right up at the top. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe one more and then that's it? Okay, thank you. Is the Jesuit mission still there? And could you talk, I mean, that such an important piece in it and I love mm -hmm. the descriptions when people the Arapaho come and the things is it still there and really functioning the Jesuit mission is still there St. Stephen's mission it's a wonderful place if you ever get out west if you ever go to the Yellowstone you go right through um, the road right through the reservation leads to Yellowstone Park the mission is still there and go do go and visit it's um, it's a just a beautiful place I have to tell you that they get a lot of tourists there now who have read my books, and they come there looking for Father John. And I had a woman tell me that she and her uh, husband went up there, and they went to Mass at the mission. Beautiful church, beautiful church, all decorated with Arapaho symbols. Uh, the stained glass windows are all done in Arapaho symbols. Absolutely beautiful. So she went to Mass, and then after Mass, the priest is standing out at the front door, and she walked out, and she said, Are you Father John? And he said, No, I'm Father Bob. Now, I know Father Bob. Father Bob is this tall, he's rotund, he's bald, and he's in his 80s. But he said to her, you know, I'm often mistaken for Father John. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.